let me take you back to your school years, to a time when you were 16. For many fond memories, time of first crushes, new discoveries, excitement about the future. For some, challenging, anxious, troubling times. But one thing we all have in common, we all remember that one teacher who stood out among the rest and made a difference in our life. For me, it was Ms. Brooke. Ms. Brooke was an art teacher in my high school back in Toronto. I was 16, and I just found refuge in Canada, escaping the atrocities of war here in Sarajevo. Of course, I didn't fit in. I kind of didn't want to. I felt forcefully removed from everything that I loved and faced with a new world, one that didn't align with my reality. And while my classmates worried about parties and who's got the coolest shoes in class, I worried if I'll ever see my grandma again, if my friends will make it alive, if life will ever be the same. No one understood me. At least that's how I felt. So I spent my time alone, hiding from the world, in this space underneath a staircase in a secluded school hallway. This is where I found my peace, to write my short stories, listen to music, and draw. One day as I sat there, a face peeked around and a voice said, may I join you? It was Miss Brooke. She sneaked in and sat right next to me on the floor. I expected her to ask me what on earth was I doing there, but instead she asked, can I see your drawings? I showed her my sketchbook and we spent some time going over my work. Then she got up and she said, come on, let's go. I need to take you someplace. Now I was sure we're going to counselor's office, but instead we went the other way and we reached her art studio. She unlocked the door and handed me the key. You can come here any time you wish, she said. And you can use all these materials that you see as if they're your own. For the first time in a while, when she said those words, I felt like I existed. I felt like I actually mattered. Finally, there was someone who cared enough to see the real me for everything that I could be and not for the troubled child that I was at the time. Two of us became close, and even though she was a wings giver, she was strict with me, and she pushed me out of my comfort zone. This is how I developed my strength, the same strength I turn to today when I face life challenges. Little did I know that years later, I will become a teacher as well. It was my love for helping others that led me down this path. And it's funny, I can even trace it back to a kindergarten time when I think I was around four or five when I appointed myself a TA, teacher's assistant. I would help other kids with their projects, lift the little ones up when they couldn't reach the sink to wash their hands, and comforted them when they were scared, sad, or missed their parents. Let me tell you, the job had its perks too. While other kids had to nap, I would get to sit with the teachers out on this beautiful terrace. They would have their afternoon coffee and I would get a break from a hard day's work. They always had a cup of coffee ready for me too. At least that's what I thought it was. Turns out it was milk and sugar, but it was the best coffee I've ever had. What I did back then is not much different from what I do today. I can't lift my students anymore, of course, but I certainly try to lift their spirits up every time we interact. I guess this is why they choose to come to my classes, even though they know I never take attendance. They feel that I care, and they care back. And it's because I care that I'm worried. Another pandemic is lurking, one that we're not aware of. 
pandemic of demotivated, anxious, disheartened students. Students who chase milestones on autopilot, convinced that the only point of education is to pass that exam or get that degree. With no enthusiasm for their future or for learning, and no one in sight to help them discover and express their true voice. Many say, ah, today's kids, they're lazy, ignorant, they don't really care. But while researching intrinsic motivation, I've had a chance to talk to many students, and that's not what I hear. What I hear is more like this. I'm just not that smart. Why should I even bother? Or they say, I don't see a value or relevance in what I'm learning. What's the point? Or they say, I've got no one to talk to. Nobody really cares about me. Motivation is a complex subject, and it's important to acknowledge the fact that low motivation can be rooted in many physical or mental problems or caused by life events. <clears throat> but the type of low motivation that I'm talking about here is actually caused by the fact that many students today don't feel seen or heard. They feel that they don't have any control over what they're learning. And most importantly, they cannot relate to whoever is teaching the course. The idea that teachers who are closer to their students are able to teach them better is nothing new. It's the fundamental principle embedded in the progressive education since the beginning of the 20th century. Yet it's evident that not much has changed since then, and we should ask ourselves why. Education is a system that is very challenging to transform. Changes take time. It can take decades to turn proposed ideas into reality. And to all students watching this talk, imagine, you guys will probably be retired by the time meaningful changes and ones catering to your generation are fully implemented. We will be late. If we're only relying on top-down reforms, we will always be late. Yes, we are witnessing certain transformations in education, but most of them are centered around um, aligning programs to market demands, application of digital technologies, introducing soft skills into curriculum. We seem to neglect another essential dynamic, which is the social construct of the learning environment that has everything to do with the way that students assign personal value to what they learn. And you can easily test this. Just think back to your favorite subjects in school and why you actually like them. Most probably they were taught by teachers who you perceived as friendly, kind, patient, approachable, just nice. And this is true for all children, regardless of their age, social status or cultural background. Teaching is a tough job. As an educator, I have great respect and admiration for all teachers and their work. For some, it's natural, effortless, and teachers around the world are already impacting so many children's lives in a positive ways. But many are still struggling and need guidance and support. Navigating class prep, teaching, research, and administrative work is a daunting task. And no wonder it's so easy to forget why we started teaching in the first place. And it's the difference we make in our students' lives. We are the ones who choose to either lift them up or bring them down, or even worse, choose not to see them at all. It's essential to be fully aware of that responsibility. Yes, digital technologies will help us teach in ways we've never imagined. But even more so, it's important to nurture the human connection and embrace the role of the mentor. If not, we will become the ones who will simply push the buttons on digital devices and interpret the assessment data. 
and our students will lose important role models, ones who still must teach them about moral values, how to care for nature, and more importantly, for one another. No digital tool will ever be able to do that. <clears throat> what if there's something we can all do to make a change? What if there's something we can all do to motivate our students, to get them excited about their future and about learning? And not just our students, but all our children, all the young people in our lives. And not someday, not next year, but right now. I've tried it and tested it many times. It's simple and it works. What we must do is become learners ourselves. Drop our ego, embrace humility, and embark on the journey of discovery alongside our students. This small and seemingly trivial approach carries so much power to change lives our students, but also ours. Start by telling your students that you want to learn from them. Of course, they will be shocked, but they will play along. Make sure they're relaxed and they feel invited to give honest feedback about ways through which you can transform your teaching to better align it, not to their needs, but to their worlds. Be curious, ask questions, instead of only providing answers. Treat them with respect and they will respect you back. Show modesty and they will show gratitude. Embrace them and they will become your partners in learning. And then sit back and prepare to be amazed. What you will discover is how much they do care. Trust will emerge communities will form. And this doesn't mean that you should relax the rules or neglect content mastery. Quite the opposite. Once students are aligned around the purpose, you can raise the standards, enforce rigor, and what you will witness is their dedication and perseverance, powered by a true force, their intrinsic motivation. And instead of a distant authority figure, you will become a close mentor, one that they genuinely respect and admire. Many refer to teaching as calling. And even though my life journey supports this idea, I don't believe it is. This would imply that only few of us can get to be good teachers, that we were called to do this. Instead, what I believe is that we are all teachers. Even when we think no one is looking, our family members, our friends, our colleagues are, and often looking up to us. The question is whether we choose to see it or not. One day, Ms. Brooke didn't come to school. Soon we found out she was sick and would not return. I had her phone number, so I called her. I wasn't really sure what to say, because it was still too early for me to understand the impact she would have on my life and thank her, and I certainly couldn't bear to say goodbye. She didn't pick up, so I left a voice message. I just asked her how she was, said that I missed her and that I hope to see her soon. I never got to see her again. She passed away not long after that. Months later, school receptionist called me at home and asked me to stop by the office. When I did, she handed me this envelope with my name and class number on it. I recognized the handwriting immediately. It was from Ms. Brooke. The receptionist kept talking about how Ms. Brooke's daughter found it in the apartment and brought it to school, but honestly, her voice got muffled and um, I was overwhelmed with the emotions. All I could think about is how to get away, find the quiet spot and um, 
open it. It said, Dear Zinka, continue writing your beautiful story and let your radiance light the way for others. I know you will touch many lives. It's not the matter of if, only when. Play your music loud and dance to it. It doesn't matter if someone is watching or not. Good luck, kiddo. Miss Brooke. No education, law, policy, or handbook in this world can make us weave empathy and care into our daily practices unless we decide to do that ourselves. So here I am today, back in Sarajevo, still dancing to my music, and the world is watching. What you're experiencing together with me at this very moment is what great education feels like. Thank you.